So on the 2nd of January 2020, Natalie of the YouTube channel ContraPoints put out her feature-length video essay, Cancelling. The video was a response to criticism she'd received towards the end of 2019, specifically in relation to her previous video, Opulence, having included the voice of Buck Angel. Over the past year, cancelling has largely come to dominate the discourse surrounding the notion of cancel culture, racking up just shy of 3 million views at the time of recording. Now, back then, I responded with a three-part series detailing all the ways Natalie had actively misled her audience or framed things in an uncharitable manner. Looking back, however, I can't help but feel like working to a tight schedule meant I failed to prioritise, resulting in me becoming bogged down with all the minutia. That's why I'm making this video, to put things back on track. Let's discuss ContraPoint's worship of known domestic abuser, Buck Angel. Though, before we can do that, I just need to give a content warning for the following. Transphobia, embiphobia, domestic abuse, fascism, sexual predation, and gatekeeping. Another thing we need is some context as to where Natalie was with the non-binary community when opulence came out. Because, as much as some people might like to pretend, the problems with Natalie didn't start with opulence. You see, by this point, Natalie had repeatedly made a series of statements about the non-binary community that many of its members found either ignorant or hurtful. And whilst Natalie would sometimes pay them lip service, hell, she even brought them up in cancelling, she never actually addresses the issues behind what she's said. As I went on to discuss in my response to said section, many of said comments are passed off as some sort of middle-aged moment. And yes, it's difficult not to see the similarities between Natalie and a certain infamous author in hindsight. So, by the time Opulence came out on the 13th of October 2019, Natalie was already under a lot of scrutiny. I personally didn't feel she was being malicious with her previous comments. I was even making fan art of her and running to her to let her know when I'd seen her jokes in places I hung out. So her reaction and the response of others around her took me by surprise. Not only was she failing to address the concern non-binary people had over the inclusion of Buck Angel, a person who has a long history of gatekeeping and embiphobia, but she was glorifying him. When Buck Angel stated that he was honoured to have been a part of the video, Natalie responded with, quote, Honoured you to have a part in it? What an iconic fashion moment! End quote. This was on the 15th of October. Two days after her video, Opulence, had gone out, and the non-binary community had made the issue known to her. At this point, I could no longer pretend there wasn't a problem. So I made a single post about what had happened, noting Buck Angel's connections to former comedy writer turned professional transphobe Graham Linehan, and left it there. That was until cancelling came out. In said essay, Natalie not only downplayed the then-obvious embiphobia Buck Angel harboured, but she tried to cast those who criticised some of Buck Angel's more abusive actions in a very unfavourable light, as seen in sections like this one. And if the true scum allegation isn't strong enough to prove it, oh, they have other pieces of evidence to fall back on to hold up their conclusion. For example, here's a tweet claiming, Natalie's trying so fucking hard to make it sound like the only thing Buck Angel ever did was write a few iffy tweets, and that's just so fucking far from the truth. Dude launched a targeted tabloid harassment campaign, outing a trans woman against her will, with the specific intent of causing her physical, emotional, and professional harm. The shorter way of saying that is that he wanted to make her suffer, and she very well could have been killed. Yikes. This ain't it, chief. Friendly reminder that this isn't a good look. Maybe don't try to get trans women killed? Disappointing. It sounds pretty serious. Let's investigate. Here's what I've managed to piece together. Scene one, the year is 2003. Los Angeles, where the movie world, the porn world, and the BDSM scene come together in a tale of heartbreak, betrayal, and transsexualism. La La Land. Dramatis personae. Buck Angel, transsexual porn star. Ilsa Strix, dominatrix, then wife of Buck Angel. Lana Wachowski, 
wildly successful director of The Matrix, at the time not yet out as a transgender woman. The synopsis is that Ilsa Strix and Buck Angel's marriage ended after Ilsa had an affair with Lana Wachowski, who was not yet out as trans. So Buck was understandably upset about the affair and, in what seems like a petty act of revenge, told a series of magazines that this celebrity director Wachowski was a cross-dresser who had stolen his wife, which I guess was the information he had at the time. So is that outing a trans woman against her will? Well, in retrospect, it seems like it, though that may not be what he thought he was doing at the time. But to really get to the bottom of this, we have to do some digging. We have to trawl through the dirty details of trans people's personal histories, which I've noticed is one of the internet's favorite activities. So I actually went on eBay and I purchased Rolling Stone issue 991, January 2006, and I'm finally able to reveal that the seller canceled the order. God damn it. But I was finally able to track down and translate a Spanish version of the Rolling Stone article from the Wayback Machine, and I'm finally able to expose the truth. Stop. Freeze exactly where you are. Take a look at yourself and what all of us have been doing for the last 30 seconds. Who does this behavior remind you of? If your answer is social justice advocates fighting for trans equality, you are incorrect. If your answer is creepy stalkers who hate trans people, I am very suspicious of anyone whose online behavior prompts me to dig through articles full of dead names and sordid scandals involving trans people from almost two decades ago. This is very similar to techniques used against trans people by internet fascists. So I'm pretty suspicious of anyone pushing this kind of investigation. How can you tell the difference between a trans anarcho-socialist with an anime avatar and a Nazi pretending to be a trans anarcho-socialist with an anime avatar? Well, you can't. Anonymous is anonymous is anonymous, whether it's on 4chan or Twitter. So unless Buck Angel, Ilsa Strix, or Lana Wachowski gets in touch with me and lets me know that for some unimaginable reason they want me to publicly dig up their 17-year-old divorce drama, this is none of my fucking business. And it's none of yours either, so shut up and go back to Kiwi Farms where you belong. Except as a trans person who is also a survivor of domestic abuse, I am strongly impacted by the presence of Buck Angel. So it is my fucking business. Because make no mistake, Buck Angel's actions towards Karen Winslow and Lana Wachowski between 2006 and 2014 do amount to domestic abuse. For those that don't know, Lana Wachowski was one of Karen Winslow's clients back in 2001, a time in which Karen was using her sex worker name Isla Strix, as she worked as a dominatrix. At the time, her business was managed by then-husband Buck Angel, who was starstruck with Lana, being a massive fan of the Matrix movie. Now, by 2002, Lana's then-wife, Bea Bloom, sought divorce over both financial and personal reasons, explaining that the decision was primarily based on, quote, very intimate circumstances, concerning which I do not elaborate at this time for reasons of her personal privacy, end quote. With the assumption the article hopes the reader jumps to being pretty obvious from the surrounding context. Now, eventually, Karen and Lana fell in love with one another, leading Karen to tell Buck this in 2003, resulting in their divorce. Heartbroken, Buck Angel went on to remarry by the end of the year. What's interesting to me is, this is a move that appears to have improved Karen's mental health significantly. With the article reading, quote, I know she was happy, says Nicolette. Right before she went to the Cannes Film Festival, she called me and said, I have my own place. I feel like a different person. I feel renewed. I'm exercising again. I'm doing yoga. I'm being healthy. End quote. Sadly for Karen and Lana, Buck Angel wasn't quite done with his ex-wife. Fast forward three years and Lana's latest movie, V for Vendetta, is scheduled to premiere, leading to renewed interest in the Wachowskis who had written the script. Now, Lana had been openly denying claims, both of cross-dressing and taking HRT, since around the time she appeared on the red carpet for the premiere of The Matrix Reloaded in 2003. This was well known, with multiple journalists covering said rumours being named in the Rolling Stones article. And so, 
Buck Angel saw a way to maximize the damage he could inflict upon his ex-wife in targeting not just her privacy, sharing intimate details of her sex work, but by outing Lana in 2006. This was not some bullshit crime of passion. This was a cold and calculated act of abuse, conducted a whole three years after their divorce. And to clarify, going after an ex-partner and their new partner is covered under domestic abuse, as is the usage of outing. This was not a scandal, as we think in the rather trivializing manner of over-the-top gossip. This was publicly visible domestic abuse, and it did not stop with the Rolling Stones article in 2006. This continued as late as 2014, a mere six years before Natalie's glowing defense of Buck Angel. In another interview following another divorce, Buck Angel was asked about his relationship with Karen, to which he responded by lashing out with, quote, Isla Strix, that's her dominatrix name, that was her real name, end quote. To be clear, Karen had stopped using her sex worker name in 2003 when she left Buck Angel and stopped working for a business he managed. And while she does have a website with that name, that's mostly to ensure she's still credited with the roles she acted under whilst working with that name. Read any modern coverage of Karen and Lana, and nobody reports on her using the name Isla, since that is no longer the name she goes by in day-to-day -day life. Which does make me wonder why Natalie chose to use that name instead of Karen. Especially since that's one of the ways Buck Angel tries to show Karen that her relationship with him still defines her a whole 11 years after their divorce. That attempt to strip Karen of her autonomy could not be more blatant as a power move. This is Buck Angel asserting ownership over Karen, like some common pimp. It is clear that Buck Angel is still very angry that Karen escaped him, improving her own life in the process. Buck Angel is an abusive man, desperately trying to hold on to power, and that's something Natalie looks up to. Fact is, the original Rolling Stones article is not difficult to find. I found an English copy with a single Google search and three clicks. So this whole show that Natalie performs of bidding on eBay before finding a Spanish translation online, it's a smokescreen. It's a distraction meant to pull you along and get you emotionally invested before Natalie yanks the discussion in a completely different direction. She flips the script, forwarding Buck Angel as a victim of stalking so she can send to his right to privacy, distracting from his victims in the process. This is just an elaborate way of her screaming, look over there! She is helping Buck Angel hide the truth behind his actions, feeling secure that his victims, people who just want to move on with their life, aren't going to come out and drag her for lying. And it's a shame to see how many people this worked on. People alive today remember when Buck Angel outed Lana Wachowski. Hell, many of them probably developed their own fears of being outed as a result. After all, an act of transphobia does not only impact the immediate victims, it impacts the community as a whole. That's why people brought this up the moment opulence went out, along with Buck Angel's embiphobia and his transsurgery pyramid scheme, Transgasm. This is shared history, and since Buck Angel was the one who chose to make this public when he outed Lana, he does not get to pull the plug on people coming to know about his acts of abuse, and neither does Natalie. And whilst we're on the various things Buck Angel has done, did you notice the semantic trick Natalie used when she led into the section? Rather than acknowledging that the issues of Buck Angel are varied due to the way he acts, she pretends as if people are just reaching for one thing after another until something sticks. The truth of the matter is, it's very possible, not to mention likely, 
for a person as terrible as Buck Angel to be terrible on multiple fronts. A common expression in the trans community is, scratch a transphobe and a fascist bleeds. Like, this isn't a shocking revelation, and it's certainly not evidence of desperation. It's evidence that there are so many things we have to ignore in order to pretend like he is a remotely good person. Speaking of pretending, I know some of you may want to argue that Natalie simply didn't know about Buck Angel, and therefore the response to her was entirely disproportionate. And you know what? That is something we'd have to consider. If Natalie hadn't gone ahead and flat out told us the opposite. Now, I was aware at the time that trans Twitter hated Buck Angel, but my thinking was, well, trans Twitter kind of hates every trans celebrity and they certainly hate me. So I wasn't gonna let that stop me. Little did I know quite how vicious things were about to get. Note how Natalie acknowledges the problem here is trans Twitter, not some anonymous conspiracy or secret Nazis. And whilst I agree, people taking issue with someone shouldn't be the end of things, it should prompt you to look into why they take an issue. Maybe ask around, find out people's reasons for hating Buck Angel, and then reach a decision on how to move forward. Don't just dismiss them out of hand and continue to worship Buck Angel, because you yourself have been criticised for your poor behaviour in the past. And before someone claims that she doesn't worship him, I just ask you to consider the following glowing testimony Natalie gives on his behalf. And then a few months ago, when I was feeling angry and miserable and despised over another time I was being cancelled by trans Twitter, we'll get to that one later, I saw this post from Buck on Instagram. Dear beautiful human being, I see your pain. It is okay that you lash out at me. You do this because I am you and you are reflecting your self-hate to me. I am strong and will be here for you forever and no matter what. This is my intention as a human being, to help others. Love Buck Angel. And then the caption, suffering. That is why the trans community lashes out at each other. I am very aware of the hate towards me by some in the community. They hate on me and others because they are hurt. And those were exactly the words I needed to hear at that moment. So I commented a heart and then Buck DM'd me and he said, I love you. And I was like, <gasps> senpai noticed me. And so I said, I love you back. This worship, coupled with Buck Angel's abuse and how Natalie framed her critics, resulted in significant harm for many trans people. It had a chilling effect for those of us impacted by domestic abuse, either in the past or ongoing, in that a part of the trans community, which had once felt safe, no longer did. And the same is true for non-binary people and those hurt by his pyramid scheme. It taught us that abusers, no matter the severity of their crimes, could be deemed off-limits from critique, as long as they made the right connections. The result of which is it further fragmented the trans community. I can't look at someone seriously defending Natalie after her video cancelling, and not see someone who is okay with the protection and hero worship or someone who abused his ex-wife publicly. And that is not guilt by association, that is guilt by mutual symbiosis. Buck Angel helped Natalie's career by creating controversy, giving her Patreon a massive boost, and handing her an excuse to whine incessantly about how hard life is because people called her out on her shit. Buck Angel, on the other hand, he gets an army of people willing to defend his actions as an embiphobic domestic abuser, going so far as to completely rewrite history. That is mutualism both parties are happy with. That's why Natalie hasn't taken the video down or apologised for her actions, because it's in her best interest not to do so. I mean, just consider the post that Natalie reads off as exactly the words I needed to hear. In that post, Buck Angel blames all of the criticism he's received on self-loathing. He's defining it as projection. This shifts the focus away from his own behaviour, flipping the script on his critics. And with that focus goes the responsibility. When Buck Angel does something terrible and people become rightly upset, this is now framed as some character flaw with them. It's effectively telling the person hurt by his actions that 
they can only be victimized if they allow it, which is not how harm actually works. In short, it's gaslighting plain and simple. It's a very dangerous stance to take, allowing someone to effectively shrug off all criticism of their actions, which is why Natalie was all too happy to open that box and apply it to her own situation. At this point, Natalie has become untouchable. The sad fact is, Natalie's attempts to paint those of us who actually cared about creating a safer community as literal fascist was highly successful. Not only did it create a chilling effect, but those of us who dare speak out on the matter are now often hate-bombed into oblivion. The person Natalie quotes while showing their post on screen, the one with the painting of a candle that Natalie pretends is an anime avatar, was just one of many people who received an extortionate amount of abuse. And these weren't big creators with their own audiences willing to rally to their defense, these are small trans people, venting their frustrations in places Natalie had to go name-searching to find. Speaking of the avatars, there is a subtle form of transphobia at play here. A lot of trans people suffer body dysphoria, or are too afraid to post photos of themselves just in case someone they know recognizes them online and subsequently targets them offline. Yes, everyone should have the right to retain their anonymity, that's true for both cis and trans people, but there's an additional layer to consider when it comes to trans people. And this crack about non-binary folk with anime avatars was part of why I felt it so important to speak up as quickly as possible back then, to counter the narrative that only anonymous Twitter users were critiquing her behavior. I'm not an anonymous face, yet I still have the very same criticism meaning she was simply poisoning the well against her critics by declaring them all to be secret Nazis. Natalie also pretends as if the issue people took with her was with some mundane aspect of her work, rather than the very serious harm she has caused. Indeed, she even went so far as to say the following. That was just a sample of hundreds and hundreds of tweets. And all of this, let me remind you, is over a 10 second voiceover clip in a 48 minute video about a completely unrelated topic. Like, how do you work? How do you create when a decision so trivial can become the main event for weeks of your life? Because while such a cool, made in full knowledge that there was an issue that should have been investigated may seem trivial to Natalie, it is not trivial for survivors of domestic abuse and non-binary folk. It's also not just a 10 second voiceover. It's how days after she had the issue explained to her by the non-binary community, Natalie continued to celebrate Buck Angel's involvement, going so far as to declare it an iconic fashion moment. I guess it didn't seem so trivial to her back then. So hopefully, now that you've listened to the evidence supplied throughout this video, you understand part of the major issue many members of the trans community take with Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints. How the discourse surrounding the notion of cancel culture was propelled to its current heights thanks to the actions of someone defending a domestic abuser, feeding into the larger abuse culture present in society. A fact that lays the groundwork to discuss the ways in which loyal contrastan, Xander Hull, tried to argue that my history as a survivor of domestic abuse was evidence that I in turn have an abusive personality disorder. Because that is a hell of a way to bully a trans person into staying silent. So be sure to click subscribe and hang around to hear more on that, as well as the other two videos I have planned as part of this series. If you have any questions or criticism, do post them below, just know that abuse won't make it through. If you appreciate what we do here on the channel, do know that you can support us via Patreon. We no longer monetize our videos, meaning that Patreon is the only source of income for the channel, allowing us to keep it running. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following Patreon sponsors. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Sora and Katie, Garrett Van Voorst, Steve Corbin, Sosh Daniels, and Justin Allen. And for myself, Udita and Levi, take care now.